without further ado, I am, uh, we are very privileged this morning uh, to have Christopher O'Reilly here, and I'm just going to turn it over. I am very happy to welcome you. Uh, one of the other things about the master class format uh, that is hopefully helpful to everyone is that I will be making my impressions known not only to the performers, but hopefully in a manner that will be useful to uh, listeners and fellow pianists at large. So we'll, we'll do it that way. Uh, without further ado, Paul Sri has uh, prelude from uh, Wells Ever Clavier. Here's Paul. Is he holding up? Nope, there he is. Do you need the music? Yeah, I'd like that. Thank you. There's a lot to, I mean, it's a wonderful performance, but I, I want to take the opportunity to unpack a fair amount uh, of, of stuff having to do with playing Bach on the piano. Uh, you know, and uh, I learned a few years ago, uh, there was a, a, a great conductor, John Elliott Gardner, who wrote a book about Bach, and it was not only a biography, but it was a book of his own journey through conducting all of the cantatas and all of the major uh, liturgical works. And uh, it was called uh, Music in the Castle of Heaven. And uh, I, I had the uh, opportunity of reading this book. I do all my reading on the stair machine. So there was a lot of time on the stair machine. And while I was reading it, I listened to all of the cantatas and masses and everything uh, recorded uh, for the box bicentennial a few years back, um, recorded by my favorite conductor, particularly of Baroque works, Nicholas Harnon Court. And it was a real blissful uh, event and, and process. But the first thing that occurred to me uh, in light of working on and working through Bach is that Bach, Mozart, and actually, believe it or not, Brahms. Brahms actually was a, mostly a choral composer. Those three composers in particular wrote primarily vocal music. And so when we have arguments about 
whether it's okay to play Bach on the piano instead of the harpsichord, I think it really sort of the, the, the argument really falls flat because basically what we're doing is playing music that was written, you know, as I say, Bach wrote primarily vocal music, and so there's primarily a vocal impetus, which is probably the most expressive instrument in existence, the human voice. And so uh, the idea of you know, listening to Harnicourt conducting these cantatas and listening to all of the variations of vocal articulation. Uh, at the piano, we tend, to, um, we tend to really decide sort of in a blanket sort of way to play things staccato or legato. Um, and I, I learned from, from all this listening to Bach that there are as many articulations and durations to a, a note in particular as there are consonants in the German language. And there are as many ways of uh, connecting a phrase as there are connecting a, uh, connecting a vocal phrase. Uh, a, 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 a vocalist doesn't necessarily make a seamless legato from one note to another. They are seeking to make a phrase work. Does anybody know what a slur means, for instance? What does a slur mean? Anyone have a, anyone have a, guess, have a guess? When we see a slur, we usually say, oh, well, you know, it means we need to play this legato. What a slur, but you know, but that doesn't, that falls flat because then, for instance, what do we have? We have notes with dots on them, staccato dots, but a slur over that, that passage. That, that gives a lie to it. I think it's easiest to say that a slur means these notes belong together. And that there are all kinds of ways of making those notes belong together. And it may be a matter of making a sort of a seamless legato, and it may not. But I think the vocal, uh, the vocal impetus, the vocal instinct, is probably the best way of, of coming across this. Um, so when we get to Bach on the piano, it's, it's really, uh, Bach has, has given us very, very few articulation markings. There are occasionally markings that uh, are, are slurred, and those markings are, are you know, probably a good indication of how he wants you to make a really sticky to the key legato. But other than that, it's really um, it's really up to you. And there are there are some that say that you know well it's you know we can do the sort of the Glenn Gould version of things, which is to say he was very diligent about assigning a particular uh, articulative profile to each line. Um, but that tends to be a little bit too simplistic, at least to my mind. I mean, it was very nice in terms of being able to differentiate one sort of articulation for one voice and another articulation for another voice. But what about within that voice? Why is it necessary to do one articulation for uh, one line and, and not make any differentiation between the notes of that particular line? So I think, I think the idea is that you know, we, we need to take Bach at his word. He gives us the notes. He gives us the lexicon, the language that we need to get through a piece. And then it's up to us to decide um, how, we want to, how we want to interpret that. And he's leaving a lot of it up for grabs. There are no dynamic markings. As I say, there are no articulation markings, except in very rare circumstances. And he does mark those occasionally. Um, but here in this particular prelude, there are no real, uh, and this is, a, we're, we're dealing with a, a very nice edition by Willard Palmer, who has some very nice um, suggestions here uh, and, and acknowledgments of, of what is in the autograph of, of, the, of the original. Um, but essentially, you know, he, he leaves us pretty well 
uh, pretty well in hand in terms of having the urtext in front of us. So this particular prelude reminds me a little bit of an allemand. Um, you have allemands in uh, the dance suites, the partitas and suites of Johann Sebastian Bach. And I don't know where, I, well, I know where I got this, but I don't know where she got it. My, my childhood piano teacher, Lily Simon, who was a Hungarian who studied with Bela Bartok, said that the Alamand was a dance between teacher and student. And I like that very much because it was, because in, and in this particular uh, prelude, could you, could you play, Paul, just play the first two measures. <clears throat> No, two, two, two measures. So you hear the, you hear the, very nice. We hear the melody in the right hand, and then we hear it in the left hand. And that's basically our, you know, our guidebook. Our, our, you know, if, if you're in a foreign country, you've got a phrase book. You know, that's going to show you the vocabulary that you're going to be using for the rest of your trip. And that's basically the vocabulary. That's basically the phrase motive fragment that we will be using to traverse this whole thing. And um, basically, I mean, in a fugue, you have truly imitative uh, reaction and interaction between the, the primary voice and the secondary voice. In an allemand, in, in, especially in light of this, this idea of it being a dance between teacher and student, you have imitative but more emulative uh, motion. So we have the, the melody and then throughout the piece that's going to change and the response of the, of the left hand is going to be emulative but not necessarily strictly imitative. So I really like that, that image of it being a sort of a dialogue or you know the teacher goes first and then the student follows and maybe has a point of interest to, to add to, to the situation. But I want to, let me sit down for a second, Paul, because what I want to do is um, ask you to, to, to look at this in, in, in terms of a, a sort of a vocal phrase. We have sort of a, we have a very tight uh, circumscribed uh, set of steps. Oh, sorry. And then it sort of opens up a little bit. And our, ed our editor has, uh, Willard Palmer, has actually marked a crescendo. Of course, we could never do a crescendo on a harpsichord, but, um, but it's, it's a nice way of, it's a nice way of, of illustrating this contour, which starts out very circumscribed and then widens out a little bit. And, and so I, I think what we'd like to do is, that's, that's a pretty good way to adopt, to, to adopt as a plan of action, that we want to have that idea um, really sort of inherent. We, we spend a lot of our time at the piano playing Bach s striving for evenness. And Paul did a very good job of playing very evenly and the voices were very clear. I would like to, I would like to explore the possibility of of having a little bit more, a little bit more expressiveness. I mean, the piano is capable of, of making dynamic contrasts, and also we have the idea of of making a, more of a contrast between voices. Oftentimes, ladies and gentlemen, when we see a dynamic mark, we see it as a, a you know, for instance, we, this this is marked piano at the beginning. We tend to take that as a direction, which is to say, all of these notes need to be soft. Um, I tend to think of it as more of a realm of endeavor, that the general, the general feeling of the notes should be soft. And again, this is also you know, a point of conjecture because, you know, as I said, Bach didn't actually mark any dynamic markings, but I think piano is a, is a pretty, good, pretty good start um, to this. But the other thing about, about dynamic markings is that they, they, 
they they relate to the general environment dynamically. And so, for instance, how many of you have ever heard of Vladimir Horowitz play in recording or in live? If we if we had Vladimir Horowitz playing like a Chopin nocturne, let's say, and the dynamic was piano, you would invariably, or, or, or quite often, you would you would get you know, would get the idea, the, the concept, that he has this great singing tone. <clears throat> but actually how he would execute this, and I'm exaggerating slightly, how he, would exa- how he would execute this was basically really whacking the hell out of the melody notes, but making the, making the accompaniment so diaphanous and, and clear, but in a clearly subsidiary you know, let's let's say he's playing the dynamic of the of the uh, of the melody forte, and the the accompaniment would be pianissimo or triple pianissimo, and then the general effect of that would be piano, and our, our general astonishment is how can he make the piano sing that much, and uh, that brings me to. The two most depressing things, according to Christopher O'Reilly, about playing the piano. <laughs> Every note that we play dies. It's not like a violin where we can actually crescendo on a, on a note or a, a wind instrument or the human voice. Every note that we play dies. And so if we want to play in an even way, we decide to take the tail end of the note prior and play it a little bit louder if we want to make a, a shape going towards a certain peak of dynamic, or we, make, we take the decay of that note and follow it and match it completely so we make a sort of a diminution, a fading away. Uh, but in any, in any case, we're always dealing with that sort of crest, the, the wave of decay and death of these notes. <laughs> uh, the, other, the other depressing thing about playing the piano is that every note, every stroke that we make at the piano is a down stroke. So, it's so terrible, you know, it's just so awful. Again, uh, the violin analogy is that it's so nice because you know, they make a down, a down bow to you know, give a sort of a gra- gravitas to the thing. And then the idea of, of making an up bow, sort of sending a note into the air. It's a wonderful feel. In, in point of fact, though, violinists, usually when they make an up bow, they make a nasty crescendo at the same time. It's inadvertent and it it's completely flies in the face of this wonderful idea of lofty up bow. So, um, and then one more thing about, about the depressing, most depressing thing about playing the piano, uh, uh, the, uh, the every note dying. Uh, the cellist, the famous cellist Pablo Casals, many years ago, was on uh, national news, and being interviewed by CBS, and uh, he said uh, he was asked, "What's the hardest thing to do on the cello?" And I'm sure they were looking for some smart aleck answer, like you know, fingered tenths or something. Pablo Casals said, "The hardest thing to do on the cello is getting from one note to another." And that, and that's that's our that's our whole job. That's our whole raison d'être, uh, because we have to always think and hear what is coming out of the piano and adjust and plan and and make that happen as we go on. What I want to try first, Paul, with this is to make more of a differentiation between the moving line. And, and the the accompaniment, so that so that for instance, I mean, you have a very nice balanced uh, balanced sort of sound, but I and, and and it's nice when you bring out you know the left hand when the left hand makes its own particular entrance, but I think we can help that by you know doing what you did, but making sure that the accompaniment in each of those circumstances is is at a lower level. This is the other thing, the, the most important skill in playing the piano. How many piano players do we have in the house today? All right. So the most important skill in playing the piano, this is according to me, is the ability to do this. 
I don't see it. What's going on? Come on. Come on. And the other hand? I uh, see, not so not so easy, is it? Right? God, I, I wish I had video of you all so it looks so silly. <laughs> not any sillier than I do, but um, the the idea of this is that I feel that the best uh, the best piano texture that we can make is one of differing elements. In other words, we shouldn't play the left hand like the right hand, and the right hand shouldn't shouldn't define how the left hand is playing. It's a very very important distinction, and it it really necessitates splitting our brain in half and making it possible for us to do two different things with each hand. Sometimes it even gets to the point where we have to get, you know, the upper part of our hand to be, you know, sort of playing out the melody and the lower part of our hand, which is very difficult because the thumb is a real big finger, make the lower part of our hand play somewhat lighter. So it's almost like that that National Enquirer story that I saw as a kid Man with ten brains. He had, it, was a, and it, was, it continues to be amazing to me, actually. Man had, like, a pencil strapped to each one of his fingers, and he could draw a different picture with each finger. Oh, my God. I never heard anything more of that guy, except for that National Enquirer headline, you know. Who should have gone on to be the most famous person on earth, as far as I was concerned. <laughs> Couldn't have had anything to do with the fact that it probably was not a true story, but anyway. <laughs> National Enquirer. So, let's get to some playing. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for you to, to do, uh, and, and play a little bit slower, and so you can, you know, look at the music and try and feel physically. Uh, I, I want to have a real a real sharp contrast between the melody and the and the uh, and the accompaniment. Okay, can you try that for me? We're doing experiments here, so you don't have to get it right on the first time. Yeah. You know, it takes, it, it really, it really, um, it's a wonderful thing because you are now, you're not just performing, you're, you are letting us into your process and you're, you're sending us information of a very particular and exalted sort of, sort of way. And it draws our ear, I mean, even if we've never heard this piece before, it's drawing our ear to different, different registers of the piano and it's it's making us realize how beautifully shaped you're doing the melody. It's it's less of a vertical event, you know, note by note. This is this is a this is a very very important moment here. I think I think it's wonderful. I think uh, the uh, the other part that you know will help this sort of thing is that um, I I I quite often uh, would encourage you to play through this whole piece at least once, right hand alone, and then left hand alone. Because again, we, we would like to instill, and let me sit down for a second, because, um, because there's, there's this, this is still melodic, and it's, but it's mirrored. It's mirrored by the left hand in tandem. But we don't want it to be, we don't want it to be matched in terms of sound. We want it to be its own thing. They, it looks like the same note values to me, but now we're going to get into uh, Leon's second law. 
Everybody know who Leon Fleischer is, the pianist? So Leon, God, what an idol of mine. Um, I never studied with him, but I got to play the F minor Schubert fantasy with him, uh, the four-hand piece at the La Jolla Festival many years ago. And so working with him was a dream, and of course listening to him speak, there's always, he always has pearls of wisdom at every turn. Um, but on one of my nights off, he was, he was playing a Mozart concerto um, with, uh, arranged for piano and string quartet in a sort of chamber version. And it was just so phenomenal. And I went backstage, I was just a fawning fanboy, just saying how incredible it was and the differentiation of their articulation and just like everything. And he just very soberly said, as pianists, we have three jobs. Pushing the notes down, picking the notes up, and then how we relate them. And so I talk about Leon's second law because all of us, all of us abdicate the picking the notes up to the pedal. That's how we release the notes. And so in this particular circumstance, I'll get very, very into the weeds here. Here we have... Here's this passage here. We want the right hand to be melodic. We want the left hand to be accompaniment. And so it's not just a matter of sound, of, of, of uh, dynamics. It can also be a matter of articulation, of Leon's second law. How long are we going to hold each of those eighth notes? If we hold the right hand eighth notes slightly longer than the left hand eighth notes, the left hand eighth notes will be a little bit more accompanimental and the right hand eighth notes will be more singing instead of, I mean, and we won't even have to like play them louder, like this. You heard that? It just hangs on longer, but I'm making that as a conscious decision. And so this, this points up the, the idea that everything I know about playing the piano, I learned from the Twilight Zone. <laughs> you unlock this door with the key to imagination. Beyond it is a dimension of sight. Look at the score. A dimension of sound. A dimension of mind. And uh, that, that dimension of mind, and a dimension of time, right? Time also has a great deal to do with it. But right now we're dealing with sound. And the sound is what we want. Just dealing with Leon's second law and making that, that differentiation between the right and the left hand. Written completely in the same way, by the way. I'm not disputing that in the least. But we're, we're making decisions on our own. You know, sort of, I, I, I sort of wish maybe we had, you know, uh, bigger note heads for the right hand than the left hand, you know? List, List did that. He would actually mark, he would, he would mark uh, melody notes in big fat uh, type, and the accompaniment would be marked like, uh, like grace notes, like, you know, sort of more italic, you know? Um, List was a genius of, 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 of uh, notation. Um, but so here, so we want to, we want to cultivate the idea of, of making the differentiation between the right and the left hand, the only way to do that, and the only way to explore on your own, how you want to do Here's another thing, uh, the rhythm, 6-8. Six, eight. Six eighth notes in the space of one measure. It's basically a measure of two, uh, uh, you know, one, two. But it's also a measure of six, two. But it's also um, a little hemiola. And so there's a little bit of interest there that, um, that I don't think suggests doing it always the same way. But I think there's a, there's a possibility of making differentiations between, and this comes up, you know, this comes up against my ADD of playing the piano, which is when I see a similar pattern, when I see a repeated pattern, I'm always trying to figure out how I might want to do it differently. And so this is a matter, again, of complete exploration on your own. I'm not going to tell you the way to do it. 
the way to do it is to is to actually uh, unlock this door of the key with the key to imagination. It's the imagination. It's your imagination. It's your obsession with playing this passage and exploring the passage, trying to create the sense of of uh, of the contour of the line. And the dimension of time comes into this because we want to make um, we want to make time a matter of your choice. You are the master of time in this twilight zone because we don't want to have a sense of metronomic time. We want to have a sense of you creating the time. So for instance, uh, we may have a sense of, of impetuosity and then relaxation. That's, that also gives us a sense of the shape of the line, but it engages another part, another parameter, another possibility of dealing with phrasing, which is to say, the, the more you have in control in terms of the tempo, how you set the tempo, how you react to local events about whether we want to play it a little bit faster, a little slower, I take a little bit of time. It's like it's like you know cueing cueing the boss, the, the boss o profundo to come in at his entrance, and he's been standing there, you know, getting his tails ready. So he needs a little bit of extra time to, to really make his entrance. You create the time. The, you know, it's not like we're we're grabbing on to a to a cable car and you know of of, of time. It's that we are create we make the time. We create the time. So all of this is a matter of, of my saying to you, Paul, that, and, and a great deal of, of, of time and uh, expenditure of energy and concentration has been uh, spent in um, memorizing this piece, of course. And, but I, even, even in terms of memorization, I find that it's extraordinarily important to, uh, to continue to work with the score because there's always something, there's always something that we've missed or something that we've, uh, we've sort of, in the shorthand of memorization, we've not noticed that part of it. And I'm noticing this about pieces that I've played for decades on a day-to-day -day basis. So if you, have a, if you have a piece that you've memorized, first time with the score, second time, without the score. And then the last time that you play it has to be with the score again. You can't just pat yourself on the back and say, yeah, I've got this memorized. Third time, you would need to look even further and, and find out what you can make about it. I've talked an awful lot, but I'm hoping this gives you some tools to, to use for your own exploration. Thanks, Paul. We have Gideon now playing some Ginas Ginas there. So are you playing are you playing the whole set? Um that's good. That's great.
I like these pieces so much. Yes. You play them so well. Um, I want to uh, get into the Twilight Zone idea of, of the dimension of time and the dimension of time being one that we should have control over. And I'm going to suggest something uh, to all of you. Uh, when Let's say we're practicing a passage that we, um, that we know pretty well. Let's say we're going to go through a passage or a page like three times. I'm, I'm guessing, I see a show of hands, we start out a little bit slower and then work it up to tempo. Right? Is that, is that a fair assumption? I think, I think that, that um, the way to gain real control over, over the passage of time and the, and, and the way that we can actually control time on a moment-to-moment -moment basis um, has to do with two things. One, a, a very, very uh, nuts and bolts way of practicing it. Let's say we're going to practice it three times. First time, a little under tempo. Second time, slower. Third time, slowest. And now, I'm not going to recommend that um, we do what I heard Rachmaninoff did, which was to play just like one note at a time. Like, that completely seems out of context to me. That obviously worked for him, the greatest pianist that ever lived. Um, but I, one, one of the things that, uh, the, the other aspect of this is actually a, a physics uh, situation, uh, which is to, to say that every passage that we play, if we want to have great control of, we want to, we want to actually be able to count it and measure it in, in half. In, so in other words, dun, 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 so in other words, we have eighth notes but I, I want to have the ability to count So in other words, that is for, for every eighth note, I want, uh, I want us to be able to count in our heads, and, and most likely it's, it's easier. Well, it's not easier, it's harder. I'm making it more difficult. It's harder, but I think we want to count it in 16th notes. And this has to do with a physics... Uh, Syndrome uh, called Nyquist's syndrome, which is to say that for every measurement that we make, it's possible to make that measurement at least divisible by half, and so um, that 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 takes us into this situation, where, for instance, like if we, if we want to slow down, for instance, if we want to make a make a slight ritardando or a, or a ritenuto. I find that this method of counting, particularly when we're dealing with sort of rubato in a sort of a nice emotional sort of way, I think we tend, we, we, we can make a more feeling of organic rubato if we do this da 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 you know, in other words, rather than, rather than slowing down dun 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 dun, you know, that's, that's what we're doing at one eighth note at a time. If we're doing it da 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 it's much more solid, it's much easier to discern, to judge whether we're actually doing it in a, what seems to be a much more obviously organic sort of way. So I'm going to suggest that for, for all of these for all of these movements, um, because as I say, you you have you have very every everything is very much in hand, very much control and in hand. But I think there there are there's even more excitement to be had if we decide to um, take a passage, or particularly a repeating passage, and. Um, Da, 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 da. You know, we have this this passage that eventually ends up fortissimo and rit, ritardando. Well, rit molto. Uh, anybody know the difference between rit, rit, ritardando and ritenuto? You call yourselves pianists. <laughs> no, I mean it's 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 a, it's a it's an honest distinction, and um, ritardando is exactly what, what I'm, I'm talking about in terms of this very uh, mathematical geometric slowing down. So we get slower note by note. 
Ritenuto is more of a general sort of feeling, like holding back the reins of a horse. So you're not holding back the reins of a horse to make every one of their steps slower. You're making a general sort of sense of holding back. So it's, it's kind of hard to tell because, you know, some composers just mark writ and they don't make a differentiation. So others mark ritardando for one and ritenuto for another. You know, Liszt is, of course, very careful about things like that. Others are not. Ginastera is not particularly careful about this. So, but I'm just pointing that out as, as a distinction that we can make because I think, I think that it's, it's nice. Uh, what you're doing is you're making a ritardando molto. And I think I think it's probably better in this circumstance. I think we were we we ended up <laughs> hanging around on this note for a little bit too long, wouldn't you say? Aren't you anxious to move on? I think the ritenuto molto, if we think of it that way, then it has to do with the figure itself, and not necessarily carrying that over to the dotted right. half notes mm -hmm. and making each one of them slower. So that might that might be a nice solution to this problem. Okay. The other situation is when we when we have when we are in this I think we can take each one of those and with the dimension of time make each one of those passages a little bit more weightier eighth note by eighth note. Because I know, for instance, when you when you make a you make a nice crescendo in in, in, the, in the third in the third one, you actually sort of hold back to the to the to the top of that fortissimo, and it's it's it actually it actually helps the fortissimo, but not because you're actually playing necessarily louder than you have been before, but because we have this added dimension of time in make in creating that tension. So that it, it's like we're pushing against a giant steel spring. The closer we get to the wall, the harder it is to push. And so the closer we get to that sforzando fortissimo, you very wisely and you know, very integrally and very dramatically, theatrically, you make each one of these eighth notes a little bit slower. He doesn't say anything like that, but it's a very, very good musical instinct on your part, Gideon. And I think, I think that in, in passages like this, where we, we're obviously starting this passage of repeated uh, passage work in forte, and then we end up at this ritenuto rit, molto in fortissimo, I think there's a, there's a pretty good chance that we want to create if not through dynamic contrast, because he hasn't made, he hasn't marked a crescendo or anything, but we want to make a crescendo in tension. And, 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 by, and by doing this, by spreading the eighth notes out a little bit more each time, we can create that tension. I can go further and say, all I want you to really do in this repeated passage is make these eighth notes uh, in the right hand, a little bit longer. Ba -ba -ba -ba, ba -ba -ba, ba -ba -ba -ba, ba 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 You hear what I'm doing? Mm -hmm. I'm not making a Richardando, but you can you hear that there's more and more space, mm -hmm. and that also has to do with something I want to talk about from the very beginning of the piece, which is to say that um, <laughs> that that we we tend to you know in this sort of way we tend to you know, make the right hand and left hand play together. But if we were doing this as an orchestra piece, uh, it would take a split second for the uh, cellos and violas, well, because they're violas, um, <laughs> to react to that downbeat. So if we were looking at the left hand alone, if we were really reacting, you know, we were really reacting to it, that, that downbeat. If it was a true reaction and not just because of your fantastic technique, just playing them in time, we, that also sets up a, a localized set of tension that, again, doesn't involve slowing the tempo down, but it, it makes, it, it, it demands a more integral sense of true reaction between the right hand and the left hand, true interaction. 
but, 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 you know, so, so mm-hmm. rather than, but, you know, not, right. not, we don't want to make it sort of roll all together. And, and the, way, the way I know that that's a good idea is because uh, at, the, at the end of this particular passage, the right hand is just playing its rhythm on its own. The left hand is just kind of giving up the ghost. So the right hand is sort of victorious. You know, the left hand is a little bit worn out from doing all those offbeats. Um, so I think we need, to, we need to accentuate that right from the very beginning okay. and set them up as different textures, right hand and left hand. Okay. Do it a little bit slower so we, hear, we can hear that reaction and interaction. Excellent. I, I want to I want to say now that I mean he, he, we we have an animato allegro texture. He's marked it piano, and so if we play three notes in the right hand, uh, even if we try playing it piano, it's a little bit harder work than you're making it out to be. We want to because and here's the other thing because he he writes in a very percussive way. We don't want to do this like a barbershop quartet. But, you know, it's, it's, not, it's, not like, it's not like we want to bring the top note out as a melody note, you know? We want to make it sort of like a drum beat, which is to say that I'd, I'd say in a circumstance like this when we're trying to get that kind of sound, voice towards the middle. In other words, don't bring out the top voice. Sort of make it, you know, sort of uh, bring out the second, the second uh, finger so that it sounds more drum-like and less melodic. And then, the other thing is he, he doesn't mark any of these uh, notes staccato, and I think if we, want to, if we want to make a little bit more differentiation between uh, harmony and melody, accompaniment and melody, if we make it more drum-like, and I think we really should play it piano, the, the right hand. Uh, the, the right hand has the advantage also of being on the beat, so it's just naturally gonna sound louder. So we have to work against that a little bit and bring out the left hand, I think in terms of volume, but also maybe, maybe it should be a little bit, a tiny bit longer, each of those eighth notes. You play real slow and just see it, let's experiment and see if that works. So now he actually gives you a crescendo here, and and because we start out in piano, that crescendo is going to go past piano, and then we're going to do subito piano here again. So I think I, 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 what I'm mostly trying to cultivate in this moment is is that interaction between right and left hand. So we really have them doing two diff, two different things. You try it up to tempo now. I think you can do that. One clue. I think I think in order to cultivate this reactive sense between right and left hand, think real hard about not letting the left hand just kind of fall into place. Think about really actually play the left hand alone. One, two, one, two, one, two. Uh, so uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four. I think there's a split second more time in that eighth rest than you're giving it credit for. I still hear you just falling right on top of that right hand. Can you try, try just, uh, it probably sound, it probably might feel a little bit sort of, you know, indulgent or, or, um, uh, or what am I trying to say, uh, sort of mannered. But I want to try it just for exaggeration's sake. Left hand alone and a little bit more time on each of those eighth rests. That's going to make it pretty exciting. Let's try it both hands together now. But really try and make, make the left hand more like a viola, more like, you know, lazy and not really playing on time. <laughs> but 
that has a nice sort of Argentinian swing to it, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we're messing around with the tempo too much, are we? We're just kind of, it's got this, it's sort of got a nice insouciance to it. It's very nice. I want to get to this passage here um, where we're, we're going to do exactly that kind of thing, but now the right hand is going to be reacting later and later. Where's a good place for you to start, Gideon? What's nice for you? Good. And go on. So, so, and then, then we're going to make it even more rich nuto here, and then really rich nuto molto. Okay. Try it up to up to tempo. Because yeah. so, you, you hear your right hand wanting to just kind of fall into place, mm -hmm. you really have to work it. Um, and I think I think this is this is going to this is going to happen when we do what I was telling you about practicing it slightly slower the first time again even slower and again even slower because now you're you're well in your mode of having worked this up nicely up to tempo yay yay us and and so what i'm saying is in order to gain control of time on a moment to moment basis we have to really plant ourselves in this sort of slowness and and again it's going to be very hard in this piece to to count it in 16th notes but when you practice it slow, uh, let me let me sit down and see if I can do it. the kind of control we want. I have no doubt of your ability to play this piece up to tempo, but I have grave doubts in your ability to, to play this and, and, and take control of the tempo on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. And that has to be cultivated. That way we have to plant those seeds. Okay? Do you agree that it's, 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 a, it's a nice way of engaging a different parameter of time in creating this sort of tension? Yeah, it really, yeah, I think it's... I think it helps, and, and particularly when we're dealing with, we're dealing with lots of these repeated patterns. Does anybody know the difference between diminuendo and decrescendo? God, you people. <laughs> no, actually, you know, I, 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 it was Leonard Schur, who was a student of Arthur Schnabel, was one of my favorite pianists of all time, and, and Leonard was a, a, was a great pedagogue. Um, he was very adept in, in pieces by Schubert and Beethoven and Brahms, just a master of those pieces. And one thing that he found particular in Schubert was that, the, the, that he felt there was a very specific difference between diminuendo and decrescendo. Decrescendo, I think we can all agree, means getting softer. Diminuendo, he felt, was getting softer and slower. And, and when you look at the, um, uh, let's say, the great B-flat major sonata of Schubert, you'll get to the end of the, um, you get to the end of the exposition and there's a diminuendo. When you get to the end of the development, when the return of the theme comes, before the return of the theme, there is a de, uh, de, I'm sorry, there's a decrescendo at the end of the exposition. There is, before the recapitulation, there is a diminuendo. And so, of course, it makes perfect sense to take time as well as make the sound come. So I've, you know, I, I put that everywhere. You know, I use it for not just Schubert, I, Beethoven, Brahms, Prokofiev, Shostakovich. I just think it's a nice differentiation. And it's a nice license of here's a, here's the diminuendo here, and and, and the, the end of that diminuendo process uh, in in Schur's, in Schur's uh, estimation was that uh, the next dynamic mark would be the delineation of the end of that process, and that works quite a lot here too as well. Can you try this passage and make this diminuendo happen a little bit in time? You know, in, in other words, 
<clears throat> get softer and slower. Because, you know, because <clears throat> look, he's got, <clears throat> this passage is marked piano, and then he marks diminuendo, and then it goes down to pianissimo. He's given you four bars to do that. That doesn't sound like so much fun or very interesting, going down from pianist, piano to pianissimo in four bars. I can do that. But <clears throat> making a relaxation in time may be a little bit more difficult and may be a little bit more affecting. Try from here again. So that, 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 was, that was an exaggeration, but, but it has a nice sort of sense of, of floating up rather being driven up. And so that, that also helps the decrescendo aspect of the diminuendo is to relax slightly. I mean, so you, you'll, you'll, you'll play with that, and that, that'll be a different thing. Let me sit down now for this second movement. <clears throat> he says, dolcemente espressivo. I, I, espressivo is like one of my least favorite markings ever, especially like when it's, I mean, if it's at the beginning of a piece, that's fine. But you know, like you know, composers mark espressivo in the middle of a passage, and it's like, play this expressively. Like, dude, what? I've been playing like a cold fish this whole time, so you have to like remind me. Jeez, thanks a lot. I think as I, the, the the way I finally make peace with myself uh, about espressivo is that I think espressivo, and and I can find this particularly when it's marked in the middle of a passage, I think is an invitation to play slightly out of the bounds of strict tempo. Mm -hmm. I think that's what they're saying. You know, if, if it was in a vocal score, it would be, they would write cola parte, you know, with, with the vocal part, you know, you know, follow them. They're gonna do something funny here. And it's gonna be slightly out of time. It's gonna be expressive. It's gonna be a little bit out of time. <clears throat> One of my, Second least favorite markings is dolce. Yep. Play sweetly. <laughs> oh, great. Uh, any hints? Like what that's supposed to be? <clears throat> are, you say, are you saying I don't play sweetly? You're saying my sound sucks, you know? <clears throat> dolce, I think, is, um, is, a, is again a, a, polar, uh, a polar pair Dolce and, and um, Cantando, which is actually a mark that comes up in the fourth measure here. Um, so when we, when we have a passage and we want to play it, you know, it's in a singing fashion, Cantando, singing, you know, playing it like a, a singing part. That's, that's one thing. And we would usually support the vocal part with the, with the accompaniment. I think Dolce... <clears throat> Besides sweetness, I think dolce connotes a, a, a sort of fragility. Let's say sweetness and fragility and, and uh, sort of gentleness would be part of the thing. So we want the melody to sing out, but maybe I think the way to get that dolce is to make the left hand not so supportive. In other words, not, not giving a nice cushion for the, for the right hand to sing but letting the right hand sing and you're just kind of leaving it out there, you know, sort of in a floating sort of way. So <clears throat> he marks <clears throat> at the beginning of the piece, Dolce Mente Espressivo. So he's, and I think the Dolce Mente Espressivo connotes, uh, denotes in the right hand what he then marks as piano cantando. So the piano, the, the piano line, the melodic line needs to be very forthrightly singing. And the left hand needs to be a lot less. And also, uh, this idea of espressivo, um, he says tempo rubato, right at the beginning of the, of the piece, in parentheses. And so I think we should really approach this, I mean, there are, there are six eighth notes per bar, but if he's all of a sudden at the beginning saying tempo rubato, he's not, he's saying, I don't want you to, I don't think 
he wants to set up a momentum, even as gentle and as beautifully as you played it, Gideon. I think, I think we need to look at this from uh, the standpoint of, of so much of Gina Astera's music, and, and in particular in this piece, it needs to be more guitar-like. And so I think we need to start this out already tempo rubato, and if we were doing it like a guitar player, just kind of musing to ourselves, with no melody in mind at all, it would be probably, it might be something like this. You see what I'm doing? How's that sound? Sound good? So, so yeah, think of it like a guitar line. Don't worry so much about the tempo. And also take very seriously his, his pianissimo marking, which in this, in this, in this, particular, um, in this particular piano texture, uh, even the best pianos, even the best Steinways, will, will always tend to, when we have repeated notes, get a sort of a waxy buildup. I wish we had sort of parenthesis we could put around notes because, because if we play each of these repeated E's, it, it just gets naturally louder. So if I, if I was doing this and they weren't repeated, I would go... And you can even hear that on the way down, that E I played a little bit softer because I've already played the E the E is in the pedal, it's resounding. So when you go after it the second time, I, I think we might want to like really pick it apart and say, um, that's basically the texture we want. So these, these next two E's, we want to, we want to start that second, that first E has to be a little bit under so that the second E carries that sound to that, that ensuing C. Because if we, if we just play them all three evenly, it just gets too loud. So think, think very seriously about it. There, there's our pianissimo, and then this has got to be even, even softer than pianissimo so that we can get a little bit louder. And then less on that last one because it's already in the pedal. We've already heard it. We, we've got it resounding. Because I wanted to, I wanted to prepare that that C. And that one, that one, because I don't want to give away that we're going to start a melody. I, I'm actually making that one a little bit less altogether. So I'm making all these distinctions within the bar, between the bars, and uh, all of this is, I think, probably, probably worthwhile, right? Yeah. Try it. Do a little bit of experimenting, and and as and as you as you heard, I'm I'm really, I'm really going pretty mad dog with that 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 melody, and I think given if if we have this sense of contrasting texture, I, I think we'll have a pretty good shot at making an overall sense of piano cantando, and it won't feel like that we're playing the right hand just too loud. Try it again. Okay. One more thing, one more thing. There's, there's six eighth notes for a six eight measure, but basically six eight is a, a tempo in two. It's a meter in two. And so we have, to, we have to think of this in terms of, and I think we get a little hung up on that, on that repeated E, not necessarily for technical reasons, but because I think you're thinking of it in six. It really has to be in two. If we were in front of an orchestra and when they, we tried to conduct them, da, 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 they would revolt. There would be, there would be union problems, okay? It would be des desperate. We have to do it in two. Ba, da, da, di, da. And that's, I think, I'm, I think I've got the right tempo. Here's, the, here's another example. There are two ways of playing with a paper sailboat. We can go to the pond and we can hold the sailboat by the tip of the sail and sort of push it around this way. 
Or we can put it in the pond and go like that and see where it goes. I think we need to do the second one here. And, but, the, but the way to do that conceptually, Gideon, is I think to think of it in two. So think one, two. Think of always going to that second big beat. Try that again. set up a beautiful atmosphere with the left hand and bring that right hand right up. I don't is anybody gonna mind? No? Let's let's hear it. Let's try it that way. From here? From there, right from there. And again, don't make the left hand influence the right hand. Don't make the right hand influence the left hand. I heard you doing a little bit of the right hand a little bit louder and it made your left hand play louder. Mm. They've got to be separate dudes, okay? And, and, you've had, and you've had three measures to get used to that idea of, of making that very soft, diaphanous accompaniment. So just stick with it. Yeah. You don't have to change the left hand at all, okay? So but maybe let's give it just like, let's do it from the beginning so you get a feel of that. And then don't think about the left hand anymore. Just think about the right hand. about getting from one note to another, like Pablo Casals. When we, have, when we have a tied note over the bar, every note that we play dies. So if we have a melody note that needs to be sounding for two eighth notes against a little bit of a, and this needs to be more accompanimental, we need to make each side of our hand, each side of the right hand do different things. The right hand is to continue cantando, the left hand, it needs to be slightly less. Okay. Can we try that? So from here. Yeah. And now, so I, I, I understand. Da, 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 dee, da. We wanted to make that die a little bit, but it's actually tied over three eighth notes. So we have to not die so much. Okay. So, that, so that the melody continues. Try just the, let's hear the right hand alone, right from there. No, see, the, the, see the, we, we need the top, we need more juice on the top. Yes, because, because we've got, I mean, I, and I understand that it's, it's a nice idea to bring out this little moving voice. That's going to happen on its own because you've got the moving notes taking care of that. We really need the help with some juice on the top, okay. right there. Excellent. This is again uh, the third movement. It was beautifully, beautifully, uh, beautifully controlled. But again, I want you to really explore slowly, having more control over the real course of time. I want you to be in control. I don't want the tempo to play you. I want you to make the tempo. All right. So, so you have to have all all the control in the world, not just in this beautiful moment where you take, where you really took control. We all felt that. That has to be throughout this piece. That has to be throughout this movement. Mm -hmm. And so it's going to take that slow, slower, slowest practice throughout this movement. And then instilling a little bit more incremental molecular space between each of these eighth notes in order to create tension. For instance, in, in, in a lot of these passages that you know, he's, he's marked no dynamic contrast at all. We really have to create tension through other means, through time, through articulation, 
maybe maybe we want to make it a little bit more sort of furioso in, in the pedal. Maybe we want to make it a little bit more articulate. All up to you, man. It's all up to you, it, your experimentation, your imagination, but also the only way to be able to do that experimentation is to really have all of the elements very, you know, very definitively in your own control right. by playing really, practicing really slowly, okay? Yeah. Thank you, Gideon. It's a pleasure working with you.
sit down for a second. Here, <clears throat> I don't know if you've ever heard, I, I, I only know one recorded performance of Prokofiev playing his own work, and it was the Toccata, and it wasn't very impressive. <laughs> <laughs> um, all, you know, every note was articulated the same, and it was, you know, sort of, sort of unremitting. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, you know, I'm, I'm very happy to tell you that you have every possibility of, of playing his work better than he did himself, <laughs> which is not something you can say that, that often. I mean, you know, Rachmaninoff, we can't say that. Liszt, you know, it's up for grabs. Beethoven, you know, Mozart. But I think I think you're in good you're in, you're in good shape <laughs> to take over. Um, now, as I was saying with Gideon, I think we. So instead of, we want to really make sure that we are engaging both hands as, as independent. And that, 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 that creates a little bit more tension and excitement. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, then I think we need to in, incite this thing, which is to say, even though these are marked fortissimo and with accents on every note, There's, there, we, we can talk about things like fast key speed and slow key speed. Even though we're in this very incredible allegro agitato sort of thing, I wish we had, you know, sort of, you, you've seen that, that um, lithograph of Brahms playing, you know, and he's got his big fat belly and he <laughs> puts his hands down and you have this sense of great weight and patience and nobility. I think we really have to play, this has to be not, not agitat. We have to really think, you know, it's like, you know, playing the opening of the, of the fourth piano concerto, Beethoven, you know, you want to play, uh, sink into the key, you want the slow key speed. This is really not going to cut it. You know, that fast key speed, it just sounds sort of nervous and stuff. So it has to be slow. So difficult because because we want to have um, we want to have the, the the both notes ringing. We want to make the right hand. We want to make the top note ring. And uh, there's no pedal marks in this, but I am going to tell you all that pedal marks are sort of working against us. Because uh, if we want to make a legato line and we follow the pedal marks, if we change the pedal right on the note itself, it creates an accent. It doesn't, and it doesn't take into account the sound that came before that we might be trying to connect. So I, I think that we really have to address these things and this is not this is not in this for this particular circumstance, but we have to really look at the pedaling that we do in terms of what is going to facilitate the line. So, in other words, if if I were going to if I wanted to connect these melody notes, uh, and I wanted to do you know pedal and then change pedal, what I do? Watch my feet, everybody. If I did it, if I did it sort of as as we would normally do, we would change, right? We would change on the on the beat. I I maintain that we need to do the following. Here's the pedal. We're in the pedal, and then there's going to be a split second that we're going to have the pedal down when I strike this note, and then I'm going to change just slightly after it. What that does. <laughs> What that does is it creates a connection between the note before and the note after. And there's just that split second where it might be a little chaotic, might be a little chaotic, but, but most of what you're getting out of it is a true connection, a true legato sound done by the pedal. Um, somebody, there was, a, there was a joke about uh, what the greatest invention in the world was. 
and somebody piped up and, and raised their hand and said, the thermos. The thermos? Why do you say the thermos? It keeps hot drinks hot. It keeps cold drinks cold. How does it know? <laughs> the pedal is the most amazing invention in the world. You don't have your learner's permit, do you? Yeah? Yes. You do? Do you always go at 80 miles an hour? I do, but you know, that's, that's just... <laughs> the, we, we, ladies and gentlemen, we all, we all have a tendency to use the pedal as an on-off switch. If we have the pedal down to the floor, all notes are resonating. If we have, um, if we go at like 20 miles an hour, what happens is it, uh, the pedal tends to resonate those notes that are within that present harmonic environment. And Lee tends to filter out all by itself all the notes, the passing notes that that uh, tend to make things a little bit muddy. So there are two things that I'm, I'm, I'm looking for here. If we had this pedal down to the metal, all the... You know, that would be a mess. If we have it at 20 miles an hour... It tends to filter out those chromatic notes. How does it know? <laughs> Well, I mean, it is, it is a matter of, of sonics and, and physics, you know, that, that the, the main notes, the predominant notes of harmony will resound more naturally and will therefore be taken up in a pedal that's slightly engaged rather than full-time engaged. If you full-time engage it, every note that you play is going to be resonating and it's just going to be muddy. Now, um, now here, here I'm saying that we need... I think we need to change the pedal here so that we get that lower note in. What happens when we have these broken chords that we can't reach, you know, all our it's a 10, it's a very hard reach. We cannot reach it and hold it, so we have to, have to engage the pedal. But if, but if we pedal the melody note, we lose the bottom note. And he definitely wants that bottom note, so we pedal, pedal there pedal there. And this is a very difficult one of these. As, as well as my thing of next note, pedal after. Pedal after. Pedal after. Pedal before. This is, this is, this is learned behavior. This is not instinctual behavior. This is stuff that we really have to work through and work on. Um, so that, that's, that's going to that's gonna help that passage enormously, uh, but it's going to take a lot of slow play and a lot of, a lot of experimentation. Um, and the, 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 longer, the longer you wait on that eighth note, the more beautiful and resounding this fortissimo is going to be. If we do it in time, you know, our, our, our mind and our ear is already arrested and, 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 and moving to the left hand. And so I, I'm actually, I may actually be sort of bunching these a little bit. One, I, ma I might not be doing that. <clears throat> I might just be taking them in handfuls. And that, that, that brings up another, another issue which comes later on. He marks agitato here, and, this, and you're, you're, doing, you're being very difficult. I think this is another one of these circumstances where we'd like to maybe take these 16th notes in a handful and that creates a little bit forward agitato motion and it also makes it a little bit easier to, to make the melody come alive. So in other words, I'm not... I'm, 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 making, I'm making a dynamic shift between melody and accompaniment but I'm also making a, 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 a very slight rhythmic shift, and I'm saying these sixteenths these are not motoric. It's not, it's, that's, that's right. motoric, and that's, that's where we're creating uh, energy and, and excitement through the actual rhythmic uh, implementation of those triplets. 
Here, these are just you know, like like guitar, you know, like guitar chords, like strummed guitar chords. So that's that's one that I just I wanted to note in passing because that's another one of these situations where we want these to be not necessarily rhythmic, but more right. atmospheric. And that I think will make it a little bit easier. This precipitato, of course, you know, you do this beautifully and and rhythmically, and it's all about the rhythm, you know, the the, the moving forward in this in this passage. So these these eighth, these sixteenth notes, we really want to be chewing on at all times. That's great. That's fantastic. Now. He marks this secco, which is a which is a good idea, and it reminded me very much of that you know Prokofiev performance of the Toccata, because every virtually every you know articulation was the same. And he's saying secco. He wants this to be short. He also played almost completely without pedal all the time. Um, but I think we really have to again still differentiate for ourselves. Uh, that we're trying to make a melody happen here. I mean, and he, he didn't mark it. He actually marks a rest here, and he marks a rest between here and here. I mean, he's really serious about this. He does not want these to be connected in a vocal sort of way, which goes against his sort of inner nature. Do you know that at eight years old, Prokofiev was writing operas? So he has... He has innately this, again, like Bach and Mozart and Brahms, this innate vocal sense. Uh, but, he's, but he has this very acerbic, modernist sort of mentality. Um, and, and, you know, I, I think very Mozartian, you know, in terms of, in terms of the, the, you know, the absolute perfect antecedent consequent structure of his phrases. They're very, very square, very almost, uh, almost predictable. Yeah. Uh, but 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 beautiful and, and and very melodic. But here, this secco, I'm I'm thinking we want to have just a tiny bit longer the melody notes. Do you hear that? Yeah. Rather than rather than all the same. Can you try that a little bit? Maybe a little bit slower so we can sort of do some experimentation and not feel too self conscious. Okay. Another, another way of thinking of it is we want to keep the left hand yeah, very, very snappy, very sparky, and the right hand a little bit more like this. Actually, can we hear this passage once? Because I was, I was, trying, to, I was trying to cultivate in you that sense, sense of slow playing in the melody and fast playing, quick silver playing in the left hand. Can you try that? I want, to see, I, want to see, I want to see your whole arm sing into it. That's the sound we want, right? Mm -hmm. Because you're still, the left hand is still influencing a little right. bit the way you're playing the right hand. Play it even slower with the left hand, but really try and think of that right hand as really weighty, really okay. heavy. I think you know, I think it's qu it's quite clear that we're still dealing with instinctual ways in which the right hand is influencing the left hand, mm -hmm. the left hand. So this right. is again a situation, and I know you have this technically, but I want you to cultivate your imagination by practicing this separate hands, mm -hmm. um, so that we can really make the right hand feel. I mean, because because that was immediately just gorgeous when you were doing it on its own. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, right. and that's what that. But, but we have to cultivate that by splitting our brain in half by playing it at least once through. Mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't say it page by page. I would say phrase by phrase, okay. because each phrase has its own texture, it has its own sort of chemical balance between melody and and, and accompaniment, mm -hmm. and and uh, also uh, uh, each has a difference of potential in terms of differentiation of texture. Mm -hmm. Let's so let's try that with this with this passage here, this secco passage. So just play the right hand and just think about playing a little bit a, a little bit more, you know, into the keys a little bit more melodically. Okay.
more thing. The one, one other thing is, is that when we're, when we're making these melodies out of uh, sometimes long notes, sometimes short notes, I'm, term, I'm not talking in terms of articulation now, I'm talking in terms of duration, mm -hmm. eighth notes, sixteenth notes. I think we need, also because it's just the pinky left out there on its own, we really have to give a lot more to that last 16th. Right. <laughs> and actually more to the 16th syndrome. Bum, 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 bum. You know how I did, I, I give a little bit more emphasis, a little bit more, you know, if we, were, if we were putting it on a graph and we were trying to graph the actual force that we were giving each of those notes, I think we'd be wanting to give more force to the 16th notes in order to maintain a sort of even level of dynamic. You try the right hand one more time. Yeah. But I'm sure it feels really weird, doesn't it? Because you're like trying to pick out those 16th <laughs> notes and you're just trying to play a melody, right? right. <laughs> Try the left hand. Let's, let's see how, how angry and evil we can make that left hand. So just, the just the left hand. Oh. That's way too, way too nice. Ba -ba 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 -ba. <laughs> play one note at a time. That's, that's one way we can do it. I want you to play one eighth note at a time, and you're you're doing beautifully because I, I don't know how I ended up you know doing any teaching at all because my teacher when I was young had me pick up my fingers like Lipizzaner stallions yeah. before I played them, and and it, it was great for for creating strength, but when I finally got to the conservatory, it wasn't until many years later and and, and hand problems and tension problems that she said. How the heck are you going to know how to play the note, or if you're going to play the note, if your finger is up here? <laughs> this is not helping. Everything has to be from the key. Mm -hmm. Everything has to be from the key. And so in, in light of the fact that we're trying to create this sort of evil, acerbic, devilish kind of sense of articulation in the left hand, we really have to start from the key and jump off as if we have an electric shock. Try one note at a time in the left hand. Let's see how short you can play those. I think, I think, you're, I think you're sinking into the key all the way to the bottom. And the Steinway, the Steinway has a beautiful ability of being able to engage on half key. Do you have a Steinway at home or do you have a Yamaha? We have a Yamaha. See, the Yamaha does not have this distinction. So this is new to you. <laughs> Yamaha is good at playing loud and soft, but... But this, this idea of having the sense of having sort of half key or quarter key, mm -hmm. in other words, not sinking down to the bottom of the key bed, but really picking it off the surface. See how, see how little you can play this note okay. before you move on. Try that. Just one note at a time. That's scary. That's beautiful. <laughs> Let's, but, but because, because, because we're just doing one note at a time, I want to see your hand shoot off the keyboard. But it doesn't. But but you're looking like Swan Lake here. <laughs> it should be. It should be painful. Come okay. on. Yes. Oh yes, that looks so neurotic. That's beautiful. <laughs> so now a little bit, a little bit faster. Mm -ba 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 -ba, and do the left hand. And each note is going to be picked off like that. Just left hand. Sir. Just the left hand. Engaging Leon's second law, we're, 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 we're going to make a conscious decision of how we're releasing this note. It's not, we're not even going to deal with release. We're just going to deal with how fast and how short you can make that. So, because okay. I, I, I feel you like wanting to sort of <laughs> sit on the key, yeah. right? I just want you to jump off like it's painful to touch, okay. like it's an electric shock. <laughs> That's it. Make, make a little separation between each of them. Let's try that. It's a little slower. Yep. And what's so beautiful about what you're doing is that uh, after you've played the note, you are already ready to go with the next note. When you're done playing a note, you prepare the next note. 
It's not up here somewhere, mm -hmm. like I'm trying to get you to do that electric shock <laughs> thing. It's very diligent and very beautifully done. So now a little bit slower than tempo. So we're gonna concentrate on making that right hand a little bit longer each note mm -hmm. and a little bit more melodic. And the left hand is gonna be just as spiky as you can do it. Okay. Excellent. Okay. Now the one, the one other thing, and the reason I want you to do this a little bit tiny bit slower is that I want you to, like we were talking with Gideon, I want the right hand, I want the left hand to react, really react, not just because I know you can play one hand after the other mm -hmm. as fast as you like. I want to feel a little bit of the tension between the right and the left hand. So it's going to be, it's, the left hand is not going to come in right away. Okay. We want to sort of acknowledge for a millisecond mm -hmm. that melody note, and then the left hand is going to react. Try that. Okay. No, that's right. But, 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 it's, but it, you see, it's something we have to cultivate. Yeah. Because the instinct is the left hand just jumps in right on top of the right hand. Mm, right. Try, so try a little bit slower. Right, try it even slower. And, 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 let's, and, let's, and let's just for the moment... Let's exaggerate the space between the right hand and the left hand. Go ahead, put an eighth rest in between there. Just, okay. just for practice, okay? great but this is but this is a whole line of work mm -hmm. right yeah and so that's why I'm saying we want to experiment with this differentiation between the hands and differentiation of articulation even though it's not marked phrase by phrase because mm -hmm. every new phrase is a new trick mm -hmm. and a new equation to be solved mm -hmm. so separate hands for each one of these phrases and then all of these all of these things you know where he finally Gives you, uh, gives you, um, these are these are these beautiful passages of legato. Mm -hmm. I would like to hear this slowly, and I want you to think about how this would how this would be. Actually, this is not a great passage to do. This one, this one is cer certainly somewhat better, because when I'm talking about doing a legato line, I'm trying to trying to cultivate. The, the lyric sense, the voice-like sense. And so when we have uh, intervals that are close together, chromatic things, mm -hmm. that's fine, they can just happen in time. If we're making a little bit of a leap, like a fourth or a seventh as we sometimes do, or an octave, we have to project that to our audience. And it has to be in a sense, it's gonna be a matter of, again, having complete control of time. Mm -hmm. not just kind of grabbing onto the tempo and going, play just the right hand alone for me. Make it as legato as you can, but also when we get to those larger leaps, I want you to give a little bit of time so we actually hear you projecting that information of the intervals mm -hmm. to us. That's right. That's right. So it's, I mean, I mean, we have a pretty nice octave machine. I mean, it's sort of sitting there, but in terms, if, if it, you know, if we were singing it, mm -hmm. it would take us a second. Right. You know, we might break our, play again, just the right hand. That's that conveys much more information to us. Mm -hmm. Do the left hand alone right now. One thing, uh, one, one matter of physics now, um, it's, it, as we go lower in the piano, it's harder to articulate. And so in this, in this passage, which is marked all under one slur, it's fairly okay and easy to do legato and fairly articulate when we get here. When we get down here, we gotta chew on them a little bit more. Mm -hmm. They're gonna be a little, almost non-legato in order to make the clarity happen. Right. It, because there's such booming notes, 
the connection is going to happen on its own, but because it's down there and there's all these long, long strings mm -hmm. that and, and all the and the, the dampers have to work so much harder to to clear that we have to think about you know the articulation you use here is fine. The articulation you use here has to be a little bit harder work, mm -hmm. and and that and that, that but that's going to be make it all the better to be able to make this crescendo because you'll be a little bit more articulate with the left hand, mm -hmm. not quite as legato, and it might take a little bit more time to make those notes right. move. Try the left hand again. <laughs> more non-legato when you get down here. Yes. And that just ends up sounding legato mm -hmm. as, as he wrote right. it. Yeah. But mm -hmm. you, did you feel how it's a little bit harder work down yeah. there? Mm -hmm. So again, we have to react to the physical capabilities of the instrument and, and our ability. Put that together. Now both hands together. sort of in and out yeah. because we've now established one point of view mm -hmm. with the right hand and right. one point of view with the left hand mm -hmm. and the left hand is not telling the right hand how to play the left hand of the right hand and you know vice right. versa mm -hmm. excellent now he marks a lot of these places dolce and semplice the semplice is very easy and you do that quite well but I want to try that, that idea that we had of making dolce a matter of not being quite so supported by the left hand. Mm -hmm. Let's, we're, we're going to hear the left hand, and the left hand is nice and legato, but we want to make it a little bit thinner okay. so that the right hand is sort of on its own and unsupported. Can you try that for me? Mm -hmm. And say that your thumb in the right hand, what's the longest finger on your hand? Sure. Count knuckles with me. One, two, three. Now look at your thumb. One, two, three. Oh my god, it's a monster. The thumb is the hardest, hardest, hardest finger to deal with because it's it's the 400 pound gorilla in the room. We have to really work hard if we want to play lighter. I, I maintain that we want this top note to be dolce, and by, by making this suggestion that we want it to be less supported, I think that still prevails for this nice sort of middle, you know, alto line. So can you make the right hand, you know, prominent, and make the left hand, as you're doing beautifully, uh, more subsidiary, but also this, this thumb line, also a little bit lighter. I mean, I, I, it, it sounded to me like you were a little bit taken aback by the fact that we didn't really sort of hear it from the first note. And that's another, another matter of the dynamic marking is piano, but it doesn't mean that every note has to be piano. Right. It's, a, it's, a, it's an area. Mm -hmm. So maybe, maybe if we don't even hear those first two notes so prominently, it's going to make it all the easier and all the better when we hear the melody coming out of that, and it's going to be piano. So don't worry about don't worry about those first two notes being sort of parenthetical. They're okay. beautiful as as you're playing them. Let, let them be that way. Okay. Try it again. That's beautiful. Did you, did you like that? I really like that. But but you know, so so many times we react, you know, visually. Okay, piano. So I got to play all notes in this dynamic. No, it's a it's a suggestion of an arena of endeavor, mm -hmm. and and that and that just that just made it. And you didn't even have to play the melody any louder, but we were so conscious of it of when it arrived because yeah. because those other notes were sort of parenthetical. I wish I sort of wish we had parentheses <laughs> on piano music. Wouldn't that be nice? Again here. As we get further and further up this ferocious passage, 
I think we can think about that, that, that steel spring that we're pressing and get closer. It should become harder and harder to play as we get to the top of that. Mm -hmm. So if it gets a little bit slower, like that wonderful passage in, in, uh, in Gabriel's uh, third, third arch team dance, if it gets a little bit slower to the top here, we're making a, we're making a sforzando fortissimo on the penultimate uh, eighth note. It's not, it, we don't want it to sound like a downbeat. We want it to sound like an offbeat. We want it to sound like it's pushing off the cliff. And then here, he marks fortissimo and accents on every note. And what you did, I think because you were afraid of the, just the, the space that you were making, you, you started playing faster. I think he's really very, I mean, he marks marcatissimo here, and you, you really react to that very well. I think you have to react in the same way here and make the spaces as fortissimo and ferocious as the notes themselves. Mm -hmm. Don't be afraid of, of playing the rests. The rests are going to make this kind of sense of rhythmic and, and um, uh, impetus uh, tension that we love so much in this ferocious past. Try from here and then really lay into these and don't, don't move, don't, don't go forward. <laughs> Let's make a little bit more of a build up and so a little bit slower as you get to the top. Not from the beginning. The beginning is ferocious. You know, just jump right in. Play the opening tempo for me, the opening of the piece. So you're actually faster than that tempo. If anything, we've got to be slow. Right from there, right from there. And again, I think we wanna we wanna try bum 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 bum. I think maybe the first and last of each of these phrases we wanna go a little bit longer those eighth notes, if you wouldn't mind. Try that. Because this is not pretty, Grace. <laughs> you play it so pretty. <clears throat> you gotta play it like a mean old man, like me. You know? Well, let's see if you can. Let's see if you can do that. Let's see if you can offend our audience with those first, with those two measures. All right. I really want. I really want us to be really upset by the way you play these. Try that. Upset. Are you guys upset? That's what music is sometimes, particularly Prokofiev. Prokofiev, and the thing that's so heartbreaking is we have that beautiful Mozartian semplice melody, and we have this angular, aggressive, acerbic, sarcastic, evil material. And so we really have to, and, and, and then you know, the other thing is, is the, the opening piece is neither one or the other. It's, it's just very celebratory. It's like a brass orchestra all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. But there are these two pole, polar opposites of behavior that you have to inhabit. It's, it's all fine to say Grace is going to play all these beautiful passages beautifully and gracefully, mm -hmm. but she doesn't really have it in her to play these nasty passages <laughs> because she's just not nasty. <laughs> you have to pretend. You have to pretend, okay? And because he's, because he, he, I mean, I don't know how much more emphatic he can get the, than fortissimo and accents on every note, right? <laughs> and and I and he also marks allegro tempestuoso, which you've established here, but he doesn't then mark pu presto here. Mm -hmm. He wants it to be solid and mm -hmm. obstinate, mm -hmm. obstinate and, and offensive, right? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Grace. That was beautiful. <laughs> been a great, great pleasure working with you all, and you've all been a very patient and, and uh, appreciative audience. I want to thank you for all of that, and I want to let you know that um, I'm, I'm doing a lot of performing these days, but I'm also doing a fair amount of teaching, 
And I live in Los Angeles, and if anybody would like to try a hand at a FaceTime lesson, uh, we can get in touch. How's that? I've got my cards out in my uh, in uh, at Betsy's desk in my in my uh, bag, so come pick one up. Thank you very much to our artists. It was it was really extraordinary. You had a question. Where are you playing tomorrow? Where am I playing tomorrow? Englewood, right right down the street at the Englewood Civic Center. Take one of those uh, brochures. There's a brochure. Two o'clock. Two o'clock. List. Right. All list. The you just can't pass up. Symphony Fantastique. Oh my God. Symphony Fantastique, the, the first hallucinogenic piece ever written. And uh, then the second half is the Liszt B minor sonata, and then the Don Juan fantasy based on Mozart. Thank you very much again, everybody.